Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis one more time, continuing our discussion and our playlist about fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base disturbance. In the previous video, we have talked about carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Today, I'll talk about acute mountain sickness and how to use those inhibitors for this kind of disease, AMS. With that being said, now let's get started. It's gonna be beautiful. So let's start at the beginning. Atmospheric pressure. Hashtag physics, baby. The atmospheric pressure is the pressure caused by the weight of air above the measuring unit. So if you are on the top of the mountain, this is the air column on top of your head. If you are here at sea level, this is the air, the weight of the air on top of your head. So you might conclude when there is increased elevation away from sea level, there will be decreased atmospheric pressure because of less weight of air above me. And this is absolutely correct. If you remember, P equals F over A. Pressure equals force over area. And force equals the mass times. Mass is same thing. It's not the same thing. It's very close to weight. So if you remove F and put mass here, pressure is the mass of air above a measuring unit should be measuring point, I do apologize. So the higher the altitude, the lower the pressure. And the lower the altitude, the higher the pressure. Why is that? It's called gravity. Gravity is in the center of the Earth. The Earth literally is pulling air towards the center, sucking air in. Therefore, you will have more pressure at sea level because it's closer to the center of the Earth and you have less pressure on top of the mountain because it's further away from the center of the earth. Therefore, you'll have more oxygen at the sea level and less oxygen on top of the mountain. It's called gravity, baby. Before we talk about the acetazolamide use for acute mountain sickness, let's first talk about the different types of oxygen. Oxygen in the atmospheric pressure is called FiO2 and this is the famous 21% of the atmospheric air. Okay. You breathe air in, you breathe in FiO2. In your lungs, we'll call it P, big AO2, big A for alveolar. Then it goes to the arterial blood via exchange. We call it P, small AO2, small A for artery. Then it jumps on the hemoglobin on the surface of the red blood cell. We call it S, small AO2, A for arterial, S for saturation. Then it goes to the tissue. And then CO2 goes to the hemoglobin, called carbaminohemoglobin. Then to the venous blood, we call it PVO2, V for vein. And then back to the lung, you exhale CO2. <sighs> Let's say you went on top of the mountain. Which one of these will be affected first? And the answer, of course, is FiO2. You will have less FiO2 because you're further away from the center of the earth. So you have less FiO2. Less air, com less oxygen coming in, you'll have less B P, big AO2. You'll have less P, small AO2. You'll have less SAO2 because actions have consequences and so on and so forth. First, let me just tell you that altitude sickness is divided into acute mountain sickness or AMS, not to be confused with acute mitral stenosis and chronic mountain sickness or CMS, not to be confused with chronic myasthenic syndrome. My neurons are interconnected and my corpus callosum is working like crazy. Treatment of altitude sickness, if it's mild, acetazolamide, which is today's topic, as well as dexamethasone. Severe cases, you're gonna need some oxygen, baby. Oxygen mask or then, if it's really severe, hyperbaric bag or even hyperbaric chamber. Assuming you have a hyperbaric chamber on top of the mountain, you dummy. Now let's have some fun. Let's say that this is a mountain, could be Mount Everest, Kilimanjaro or whatever. And you are that blue idiot on the top. Why do you call me idiot? Because your P big AO2 is low. Why do you call me blue? Because you'll get hypoxia because the P small AO2 is low. 
nothing is free. Actions have consequences. You have short-term consequences and long-term consequences. Let's start with the long-term first because it's easier. First, you have hypoxia, which means less oxygen available to the tissue. The oxygen doesn't come walking on feet. It orders an Uber cab. This Uber is the red blood cells. So, for you to solve the problem of hypoxia, and if this is your Uber, let's say here is your Uber. Okay, nice car. All right. Nice driver. Five stars. And then you have the oxygen. You have four oxygens in each Uber called hemoglobin or red blood cell. So the passengers are the oxygen molecules. The Uber is the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. So for you to solve the problem of hypoxia, you can increase the passengers. How do you increase oxygen? This is the lungs job by hyperventilating or by increasing the number of Uber taxi cabs. How do you increase the number of red blood cell? This is EPO's job. The lung does it short term, EPO does it long term. EPO will send a dispatch to the bone marrow to announce a surge to this area. So more Uber drivers will hit the road. We call this erythrocytosis. Is this appropriate increase of EPO or inappropriate? It's appropriate. Of course it's appropriate. Why? Because of hypoxia. If EPO is not gonna rise in case of hypoxia, when the flip is it ever gonna rise? That's the freaking job of EPO. It's appropriate increase. EPO stimulates the bone marrow, the bone marrow secretes red blood cell. This is called secondary polycythemia, which is the exact freaking thing as secondary erythrocytosis. Emia means blood. Cythemia, cytes are the cells. We're talking here red blood cells. And poly means many. Erythrocytosis, osis means condition. Erythrocyte are the red blood cells. It's a condition where we have lots of red blood cells. Same exact freaking thing. We're done with the long term. Thank you so much, Apo. Let's talk about the short term. On the short term, you have less oxygen going into your brain. You'll get headache, but your respiratory center and your brain stem is gonna kick into gear. It's gonna tell your lung, hey, wake the flip up. Let's hyperventilate to provide me with more oxygen because I'm the boss sitting on the top. At your service, sir, the lung is gonna hyperventilate. Why? To try to increase the PaO2, but at the same time, it's gonna wash out CO2 at the same time by the same token. When you are hyperventilating, <sighs> more oxygen in, <gasps> more CO2 out. <sighs> and when you get rid of an acid, we call this alkalosis, caused by the lung respiratory alkalosis. Now, five minutes ago, you were wondering why use acetazolamide for acute mountain sickness I hope I answered your question, because acute mountain sickness leads to respiratory alkalosis, acetazolamide leads to metabolic acidosis, both of them can balance each other out, and we are aiming at equilibrium. Also, as we will discuss two minutes later, we will have pulmonary edema and cerebral edema in cases of acute mountain sickness, and acetazolamide is a freaking diuretic, so it can decrease the water that's all over the body, around your brain and around your lungs. We call this high-altitude cerebral edema and high-altitude pulmonary edema. I rest my case. Then we have hypoxia leads to hypoxic vasoconstriction. Why? We'll discuss this in the next slide, but hear me out hypoxic vasoconstriction. You are constricting your vessels. As you know, pressure equals force over area. When you vasoconstrict, you decrease the area. When you decrease the area, you increase the pressure, provided that the force remains constant, called physics, baby. So vasoconstriction will increase its pressure. The pressure inside the vessel is called hydrostatic pressure. When you increase the pressure in the vessel, it's gonna be more than the pressure outside of the vessel, forcing fluid out. You end up with edema, baby. Edema around your brain called high altitude cerebral edema. Edema in the pleural cavity around your nice lungs called high altitude pulmonary edema. What are the symptoms of pulmonary edema? You have fluids around your lungs. You're gonna cough. Okay. What else? Frothy pink sputum. 
Why frothy? Because it contains air. Why pink? Because it contains blood. Blood? Yes, because when you have pulmonary edema and you cough, you might rupture small bronchiolar vessels and you will end up with pink sputum. So frothy pink sputum equals pulmonary edema. What else? You are not an SOB, but you have shorts of breath. Why? Because you have fluids around the lung, constricting the lung. The lung is under siege. In other words, you have decreased the surface area available for air exchange. Okay, what about the brain? There is something in medicine called the Monroe Kelly hypothesis. What the what? It means your skull is 100% full, stacked with stuff. There is not one single centimeter available to put anything else in it. It's stacked, baby. Therefore, anything else that happens in the brain, for example, edema, it's gonna cause headache. No wonder. It's gonna raise your intracranial pressure because your, your brain is 100% stacked. It's like the Uber pool during rush hours, stacked, 100%. When you have edema, it's gonna push on other structures because there is no space and your intracranial pressure is gonna rise. Ooh, leading to number one, headache. Okay, number two, unsteady gait. Oh, you're wobbly. Why? Because the increased intracranial pressure is gonna tamper with the centers responsible for the proprioception or whatever, the flip in your brain, and your gait is gonna be unsteady. What else? Loss of consciousness can happen. Nausea and vomiting if they pre press on the brain stem. Retinal hemorrhage due to increased intracranial pressure, and your eyes are an extension of your brain. When the pressure in your brain rises, the pressure in your eye rises, you may pop up your retina. Question, does this headache respond to analgesic? Hell no, it's caused by an increased intracranial pressure. No matter how many analgesics or aspirin tablets or ibuprofen you're gonna take, it's not gonna help your headache, baby. Your, your problem is bigger than that. Someday I might die, but this glorious slide will remain forever, hopefully. I've promised you five minutes earlier that I'm gonna talk about hypoxic vasoconstriction. Look, honey, most tissues respond to hypoxia by vasodilation, which makes perfect sense. If you have hypoxia, you have less oxygen going to the tissue, please dilate your vessels to try to send more oxygen to the cells as much as you can. Makes perfect sense. The lungs, however, are crazy, are weird. Why? Because the main purpose of lung is not just to take oxygen, it's gas exchange. Is it's to give you oxygen to the blood and take CO2 from you. So let's say that this part is hypoxic in the lung. The lung is gonna vasoconstrict this bad area, trying to force all the blood to the other normal and fine spaces in order for them to exchange gas because these places are functional. They will get oxygen into the blood and take CO2 out. So this is called hypoxic vasoconstriction. And when you vasoconstrict, the area is going to decrease, the pressure is going to increase, called hydrostatic pressure, you'll end up with edema called pulmonary edema. Thank you so much. Here is a very weird but interesting phenomenon. Facial swelling at high altitude. Why? Because Friedrich Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow. We know that at sea level there is more pressure and at mountaintop there is less pressure. Your body is used to living at sea level. So, you have inside your head some pressure. And the pressure inside your head, or Einstein head, is balanced with the pressure coming from outside. These two forces balance each other. That's why you remain intact. But when you go on the top of the mountain, there is less pressure coming from the outside. And all of the sudden, the pressure inside your head or your skull or your face is greater than the pressure on the outside, which will result in facial swelling. So the answer to this phenomenon is not in medicine, it's in physics. And since I'm an Egyptian guy who is multilingual and multifunctional, I could explain it for you. The jack of all trade is the master of some. 
We have talked about polycythemia before. Let me remind you that it's relative or absolute. Absolute could be primary, such as polycythemia vera, or secondary, which we're talking about in cases of hypoxia. It could be compensatory or appropriate increase in APO in response to hypoxia, such as high altitude or acute mountain sickness. I've discussed the oxygen dissociation curve in a previous video, but in brief. Here we are talking about the tissue. Oxygen leaves the blood. Oxygen leaves the hemoglobin and enters into the cell. Oxygen dissociates from the hemoglobin. That's why you end up with decreased SAO2. At the lung level, you have oxygenated blood. Oxygen leaves the alveoli and jump on the hemoglobin. This is called not dissociation, but oxygen binding. If this is the normal oxygen dissociation curve, the question is, can we shift it to the right? Yes, we can. What does it mean? When you shift the curve to the right, you decrease the y-axis, which means there is less oxygen on the hemoglobin called oxygen saturation or SAO2. Therefore, oxygen must be in the tissue. If it's not in the on the hemoglobin, it's in the tissue. So when you have right shift, you have increased release of oxygen from hemoglobin to the tissue. Hashtag giving. The opposite happens with the left shift, and I've talked about it in a previous video, but in brief, with left shift, the tissue is left behind with no oxygen. Here are the shifters. Shift to the right, shift to the left. High altitude shifts to the right. Why do you want to shift the oxygen dissociation curve to the right? Because I want to increase giving. I want to increase giving of oxygen to the tissue because in high altitude, you suffer from hypoxia. Have you noticed? So here's everything in one slide. High altitude, decrease FiO2, decrease P big AO2, decrease P small AO2. You have hypoxia short term. You have hyperventilation and headache and facial swelling. Hyperventilation will lead to respiratory alkalosis. That's why using acetazolamide is a brilliant idea. What else? Short term, you have shift to the right of the oxygen dissociation curve to increase giving oxygen to the tissue. Also, hypoxic vasoconstriction will decrease the area and increase the pressure called hydrostatic pressure, leading to edema around your lung, pulmonary edema, specifically high-altitude pulmonary edema, happy, and around your brain called high-altitude cerebral edema, HASI. High-altitude pulmonary edema will lead to cough and shortness of breath, as well as the pink frothy sputum. The high-altitude cerebral edema will lead to headache, unsteady gait, nausea, vomiting, retinal hemorrhage, and maybe loss of consciousness. Long term, you're in good hands because EPO is gonna increase appropriately, signal to the bone marrow to cause secondary polycythemia and secondary erythrocytosis. When you have more red blood cells, as well as right shift of the oxygen dissociation curve, you're trying your best to treat the hypoxia. I am a visual learner, if you can only imagine, so that's why I love Picmonic. They are mnemonics in pictures, and check the link in the description. They are not sponsoring this video. I just like these guys, therefore I recommend them to you. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe and join the tribe. Hit the bell to get notified. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis to get the notes, and you can download the PDF of this lecture only on Patreon, and when you download it, it's yours forever, baby. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.